Welcome to the Meb Favor Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. This podcast is sponsored by the Soothe app. We all know how stressful investing in volatile markets can be. That's why I use Soothe. Soothe delivers five-star certified massage therapists to your home, office, or hotel in as little as an hour. They bring everything you need for a relaxing spa experience without the hassle of traveling to a spa. Podcast listeners can enjoy 30 bucks to their first Soothe massage with the promo code MEB. Just download the Soothe app and insert the code before booking. Happy relaxation. Hey everybody, it's time for another Q&A episode. We got Jeff Rimsberg back in the studio. Jeff, how are you doing? Good, thanks. So first of all, thanks for all of the feedback. Keep them coming. If you guys keep sending all these questions, we could even start doing this as much as weekly. Send emails into feedback at com. Also, thanks for all the reviews. Really, really appreciate it here. Keep them coming. If you haven't left one yet, please re- leave a review on iTunes, as well as if you're enjoying the show, pass along to some friends. I think it's been a lot of fun for us to produce and hopefully a lot of fun to listen to. So if also you have any suggestions, keep them coming as well. So after that, Jeff, I'll uh, turn over to you. Fire away. Sounds good. So what we have this week is a lot of the questions have come in in uh, similar categories. So I've grouped them together, figure we can just knock them out subject by subject. A couple things as well. Uh, if you wrote in, uh, please note that I've annotated your question, trying to trim it down a little bit. So uh, please note emails that I've misquoted you. Change the name of the innocent. So we're not going to quote your name. If you have a really question you're embarrassed to send in, send in anyways. Good chance someone else has the same question. Absolutely. All right, let's start off with some managed futures questions. First one, is there a cost-effective way to get a 20% to 30% allocation to managed futures if you have a portfolio of fifty to $100,000? Bonus points if you come up with a solution that's available to European investors. So as you remember, managed futures is an investment strategy. Typically, it means going long and short, a lot of different markets around the world. It's Most managed futures are trend-following strategies, although not all of them are. Let's call it maybe 80% are. Another 20% are short-term or arbitrage or high frequency. But in general, when we talk about managed futures, we mean the trend-following strategies. And historically, these have been around since the 70s. So famous names like John Henry, owner of the Red Sox, Dunn, Chesapeake, Campbell, Harding, HL, all of these are famous managed futures companies. Historically, they offered them through commodity trading advisors and CPOs, commodity pool operators. So CTAs and CPOs, those are like the private versions of uh, commodity versions of hedge funds. And so traditionally, they've been a 2 and 20 fee structure, 2% management fee, 20% performance. Well, as we've seen this sort of evolution in publicly available funds over the past 10 to 20 years, you've seen a lot of these managed futures funds transition into mutual fund format. So there's, a, there's two types. One is a fund to fund type, which when we talked in this episode with Eric Crittenden recently, we kind of, he mentioned you got to be really careful because they can be super high fee. Mm-hmm. And in some cases he said up to five to 10% per year. The other type is actual a managed future mutual fund manager who actually manages the fund. And so you can buy, there's a whole bunch of those. You can go to Morningstar, sort them. You got to be a little careful. A lot of them are pretty expensive, but in general, there's a handful of, of good fund companies that we think, you know, PIMCO has some, AQR, Natixis, Longboard, they all have kind of lower cost managed future strategies. And there's a few ETFs that do it. The ETF uh, place isn't as developed as we want to see it yet, but hopefully that'll change soon. Can you put some parameters around the universe of cost that somebody should be looking for from low end to high end? You're not going to see Vanguard and Schwab. I mean, I would love for them to enter this space, but historically they've shied away from a lot of the managed futures area. 
So a lot of the traditional fee pressure shops don't exist here. So you see a little higher fees. So I imagine if I had to guess the average mutual fund fee is one and a half to two for, for the individually managed funds. But there's some that I believe are below one or, or pretty close. And then the ETFs are lower cost, but they're not, they're based on indexes that I think are kind of first generation, kind of 1.0 indexes that do some screwy things like they don't short the energy complex. And the reason being is when they put out the index, energy had only gone one way, which was up. And of course, what happened, we all know is energy has gotten destroyed since. So again, same rules apply. Try to pay as little as possible, but it's a little more challenging in managed futures. This is one asset class strategy. It's not an asset class, but a strategy where due diligence is rewarded. So you need to be really careful in looking into the fees, looking into the manager, uh, but there are some uh, pretty good shops out there. And then the traditional CTAs too, the only challenge there, it's a little harder to allocate to for the individual investor. Plenty of institutions can allocate to these, but those typically come the two and 20 performance, but a lot of those guys have been around a lot longer. There's a good website, I think it still exists, IASG.com, and we'll put it in the show notes that ranks up on the managed futures managers. Attain Capital used to do it. Morningstar has some rankers. We'll put some in the show notes for some uh, resources too. Okay. Sounds like a bunch of what you mentioned would be available to European investors, but is there anything in particular you want to highlight? No. I mean, I don't have a firm grasp of the European landscape that's any better than what's available in the U.S., so I'm gonna I'm gonna punt there. No no go, extra gold stars for me. All right, let's move on to the second one then. Given current bond yields, what assets would you suggest holding in a trend following strategy while in cash? Would you stick to short term bonds, diversify with several different bond funds, or actually hold cash? So when we published our first white paper 10 years ago, it's crazy, quantitative approach tactical asset allocation, we demonstrated a very simple trend following strategy, which was long an asset when it's above its long-term moving average. We use the 10-month simple moving average and out of the asset when it's below. And so sitting in cash or T-bills. And one of the questions that we implemented in the paper in, in follow-on years was if you spend a fair amount of time in cash, and so that model on average spends about a third of the time in cash, so over the total portfolio, you're really sitting 70% invested, 30% in cash on average, or roughly around there. But at times it can be 100% cash, and times it can be fully invested like right now. If you instead put the cash component or what people call the collateral component in 10-year bonds instead of T-bills, you add a little over another one percentage point of performance per year. Now, the problem with that is that the vast majority of that period has existed during a bond bull market. So from the 80s till now, you've had bonds go from double digit yields to low single digit, one and a half or whatever we're at right now in the 10 year. So is that likely to repeat? So we went back and looked at the 70s, a rising interest rate environment and said, how would this have affected taking that extra duration risk for the cash in your portfolio? And it actually didn't hurt. So one of the takeaways could be, look, if you want to move out the yield curve to five or seven or 10 year treasury, that's totally fine. We also think it would be fine to add some global bond yields. So it's our global bond exposure. So if you had the cash portfolio and wanted to put half in US treasuries, half in global bond uh, sovereigns, I think that's totally fine. You know, and we showed in our white paper, even ranking global bonds on on value and sovereign bonds works well too. So that's reasonable. But you're speaking in general right now on a yield perspective, right? Not a risk perspective. Well, it's both. It's, it's a, it diversifies, you know, the US treasuries play a very particular role as a diversifier to risk off type environment. You can't count on it, but, but historically, most of the time they have. But global sovereigns should as well. Now, the problem with global foreign bonds, debt weighted or market cap weighted, means you're in the stuff that has an even lower yield than the US. So there's not a lot of cushion, some of them of which are negative. So if I was gonna go into foreign bonds, I would pick based on a carry strategy or like some of our funds that do it. What you don't wanna do is what John Corzine did at MF Global, which was leverage up a bunch of European sovereign bonds 
and leverage it up a bunch and blow up his entire business, right? So you never want to leverage the, the this is supposed to be the safe part of your portfolio. Right. So if you want super low vol, don't want to take any risk with it, fine. Put it in CDs, cash, T-bills, totally fine. If you want to eke out a little more returns, fine. Put it in five, seven, 10 year bonds. And if you want to diversify away from US dollar risk, I think it's totally fine to put say half of your collateral into foreign sovereigns, but particularly I would tilt away to the higher yielders. And then if you can think of other cash like substitutes, I think that's okay as well. And this is actually real quick. If you look at the, uh, managed futures, for example, historical returns, the collateral, and this is a little different because it's futures. You're using uh, most of the accounts that's in cash or T-bills, and then you go buy futures. And you only need to post about 5 or 10% of the overall account value as margin for these futures. Most of the account sits in cash. Well, managed futures is a strategy. It's something like half the historical return is that collateral yield. And a lot of people don't know that. That was a big tailwind for managed futures when collateral was yielding five, six, seven, eight percent. And now mm -hmm. that it's yielding one, you're not going to see as much of that return from the collateral yield. So that's why you saw people do screwy stuff like what Corzine did. But in general, our default is do you want to take as little risk as you can with the, the safe part of the portfolio. Well, the, there's that growing percentage of people who are afraid about the 10-year market rolling over. Do you share that concern at all? Would that steer you closer to uh, straight up cash? I mean, who, look, who knows with bond yields? You never know. I mean, the U.S. is one of the higher yielding developed countries, which is kind of amazing at one and a half or whatever it is. But if you look at Japan, for example, number two economy in the world, when they cross below 2% yield... I think it was in, I'm going to blank on this, 97 maybe. It hasn't gone back above since. Yeah. You know, so is the U.S. our most global developed nations in for a period of 10, 20 years of just low interest rate environment? I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't shock me. It just happened in Japan. You know, the answer to trying to predict interest rates, I, I think, is, is foolhardy, but rather say, look, if you're more worried about volatility, just go low vol, buy T-bills, and that's fine, or five-year, whatever. You could always add some sovereigns as well in, in, uh, in foreign countries. All right, to wrap this one up, what specifically would you personally choose? I would do a mix. I would do, say, mid-yield curve treasuries, so maybe seven-year treasuries, and then I would add a certain percent on sovereign high-yield bonds, but I would not take that over 50%. All I'd right. keep it below 50 all right, let's go to the next one. I've been thinking about allocation to a trend-following ETF. What about the increased fees from the increased turnover? I haven't found a way to measure that. So you can scratch the word trend-following from that and just say any strategies. Traditionally, obviously, strategies with lower turnover have lower transaction costs. You know, a buy and hold strategy that never rebalances isn't going to have any transaction costs. A strategy, it doesn't matter if it's trend following, if it's, if it's equity screening, if it's a bond portfolio, if it's a portfolio that base, you know, trades based on the calendar, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the turnover and liquidity in those markets. And so markets that are highly liquid, US large cap stocks, futures markets have very low friction costs. Markets that are not that liquid, say, trading stocks in Colombia or uh, foreign corporate bonds or even U.S. corporate bonds that often on any given day don't even trade, those markets are going to have more friction. So whereas trading you know, U.S. large caps, every time you make a round trip, that's only maybe a few basis points, trading some of these other markets, it adds up. So it's really about what markets they're trading, trend following strategies, you know, it depends on the style. You can't just say any trend following strategy, the long term trend following is going to have a lot less turnover than short term. In general, the rule is yes, lower turnover, the better, but also the more liquid markets, the better. But then, of course, you get into a lot less of the really big money is trafficking in the emerging markets. So there's more potential for alpha there as well. So you got to find the right balance. But yes, you have to absolutely be aware of transaction costs in any, any given market and strategy. As a percentage of your total investment, how much would you personally be willing to pay in transaction costs? I, I think it depends. You know, I mean, it's, it's more of a how much a or, or is it a beta replication strategy? In, the, in that case, you want to say just I want to replicate this asset class with as little turnover and cost as possible. Or is it a real alpha generator that you think is going to generate three percentage points and extra performance per year? And then you got to say, okay, this was on paper. How much of that is actually 
being generated and you know what is a reasonable amount and then you can compare the fund returns versus say the hypothetical index eric crittenden talked about this in his awesome interview where he talked about back when he was in college comparing a paper portfolio that he was tracking in real time to back tested results and the back tested results were amazing but in real time when he compared the back tested results to the paper portfolio the paper portfolio did terrible and the back tested did great and the reason was because the stock database he used for testing had a huge survivor bias so it's different problem but similar if you were to say all right i'm going to actually trade this look at the transaction cost versus this hypothetical yeah i mean it's a very real friction that a lot of people don't don't think too much about all right let's move away from managed futures and head over to tilts so question number one is i struggle with how to find a way to screen for quality I just finished listening to your podcast with Pete Medina, and he alluded to profitability as a factor. Have you done any work on quality? Pete's is one of the most popular podcasts, and for good reason. You know, Pete's a really bright guy. If you ask any number of shops what their definition of quality is, you'll get different answers. But if you look up either O'Shaughnessy's What Works on Wall Street book, AQR's paper on Buffett, any of Wes's work at Alpha Architects, all these GMO, those guys have done a lot on quality. They all talk a lot about quality and it, it means a number of different things, but, but we'll talk about a few. So one, you can think of the actual earnings growth. So look at a stock and say, is the factor such as, is there a decrease in profitability or earnings decreasing year over year or three year earnings growth? Um, are there negative earnings surprises instead of positive ones? Would you factor in like repurchases there since that can manipulate the EPS? We do factor it in in our models, but for pure quality, I would not. But so, but so it, and here's another there's another tangent. So financial strength is a good one. So change in debt is a good example of financial strength or the debt ratios or how much cash flow they have relative to debt. Those are all kind of financial strength metrics. And so a company that's buying back their stock traditionally is going to have more cash. And so th there's a lot of variables that overlap. Another one would be accruals and, and earnings quality. And then, so there's a handful of others, but you always have to ask, you know, do they, do they work? Does it matter? I mean, total debt in general, that's a change in total debt is a, is a great one. And a lot of the people use quality, not as an initial screen, but as to kind of skim off the crud at the bottom. Say, Hey, look, we're going to take the top quartile of our multi-factor model, but we want to get around, get away from a few of these maybe value traps that actually are just junky companies that otherwise look like good value companies. So the, uh, you see a lot of people that do the screens, they'll include it as kind of a, a junk sweep stage of the, of the screen. But you know, we, we use some of these metrics in our, in our funds. Uh, we think it makes a lot of sense. It particularly makes sense when the bear markets happen because a lot of the highly levered junky companies get punished and we haven't seen that in the last seven eight years so at some point we'll have bear market again but who knows when okay so for this listener who's looking for sort of a, a way to, to begin his, his understanding of quality are there one or two metrics that you would point them toward that you think are more effective I, I don't know that i have any favorites i mean in general for me it's avoiding the high leverage through debt so you could do debt to equity debt to total assets change in debt those all to me are, are ones. Petrovsky talks a lot about these steps in his, but uh, we'll point the readers to a few books in the show notes that are these kind of quant factor screening Bibles. But of course, always start with a, one of the earliest and best, and that's what works on Wall Street. All right, next question. Do you believe that the development of smart beta, specifically the factor-based smart beta ETFs, including momentum, value, low vol, et cetera, will that essentially kill the edge of these factors? So anytime more assets come into an asset class or strategy, if it's an arbitrageable strategy, it, it by definition really reduces the returns of that strategy. So yes, is value investing harder when there's tons of flows going into? And we've always said that flows change factors. And the good example we've been giving in the last few years is that all this money that's rushing into dividends, that's rushing into low vol, has changed the attractiveness of the asset class, and now it's not that of attractive of a factor to allocate to. Is that because of flows, or you call it smart beta and arbitrage? Yeah, I think so. Uh, there's some strategies, but however, the funny thing about it is that it's not like it's a permanent thing. So for example, what's gonna happen? Well, 
dividend stocks will do poorly for a few years or they get, they'll get crushed in the next bear market or whatever it may be, then people will hate dividend stocks for a while and they'll be interested in only, you know, solar producing autonomous car stocks or emerging markets will come back into favor and everyone will rush into, you know, investing in whatever the next version of the bricks or commodities or whatever it may be. So rinse, repeat. So it'll get to the point where value stocks or dividend stocks get out of favor for five, 10 years. And then all of a sudden it's a great time to be buying those again. And so yes, money will washing in and out of any strategy. I think will it in our has been talking a lot about this. Cliff has been talking a lot about this on changing the, the, attractiveness of any given strategy but a lot of these underlying factors i think they're timeless and universal over 50 100 years so if you were to bet on them for the next 50 years it's going to work but there's going to be absolutely various periods where any asset class or any strategy looks wonderful or terrible and what we've seen from all the behavioral research people chase the returns be buying these strategies at the worst possible time, the way we think about dividends and low vol right now. And then of course, when they've gone completely out of favor, same thing happens with managed futures. Managed futures had something like three, four down years in a row in the mid or the late 2000s, early 2000 teens, everyone declared trend following is dead. And what of course happened, they had some great returns after. So it, it happens everywhere, but I don't expect it to be a long-term permanent efficiency in any of them sounds a bit like fashion where certain styles go in and out of favor of the years and you see sort of this circular pattern have you done any studies as to maybe the the rank or the order of these factors is there any sort of consistent history of all right starts off with value then it moves to low ball then it yeah moves there's to so fashion's a good example except for maybe you who's been wearing fleeces for 30 years i look amazing <laughs> and so there's two schools of thought currently you know there's the asness which is look there's a bunch of factors find a bunch of them that don't correlate put together a portfolio and you don't try to time it and there's rob recently who's been talking about yeah look you know i think it makes sense to, to move away from some of these when they get really expensive or vice versa relative to their own history I'm not totally decided yet. I want to believe that it's possible to time just because I, I want to think that it's that it's doable. But I think having a number of approaches that do zig and zag, I mean, in the, the most two traditional ones, value and momentum, it's a great example. They almost never work at the same time. And so you have periods where one's not working, the other is. And you can have uh, the, the complementary one plus one equals three by putting uh, both into a portfolio. But even the, the the basic, do anything, move away from the market cap portfolio, then you'll end up with a better than just the broad index. You hate market cap. Hate it. Hate <laughs> it. It's having a great. It's been having a great run though in the U.S. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, that's sort of a good segue into valuation. Uh, quick question on this: It's often difficult to distinguish signal from noise when evaluating different factors. For example, some say the forward PE is the way to go, while others swear by trailing 12-month PE. Still others say trailing 12-month is useless. Do you have any suggestions for metrics, methods, or insights to get a hold on how to start effectively using the myriad indicators out there? So anytime you pick just one indicator, you're setting yourself up for a lot of these binary outcomes. And two, take a step back. One, you should also test to see if any indicator works. So there's an example of you know, people talking about, hey, dividend yield is higher than bonds right now. Therefore, stocks are vastly more attractive. Well, that was true for the first half of the century. You know, and, and just because it wasn't true for the last 10, 20, 30 years doesn't mean that it's not going to be true again. So if you got to look at these factors, like the Fed model was in some Fed notes in the Greenspan tenure, but it worked and it worked okay in parts of the later half of the 21st century or 20th century didn't work at all for the first half. So the, the, a lot of these indicators, if you get one, does it work at all? And so he, the listener mentioned a number of valuation factors. And if you applied them to say the U S stock market, you would learn that a lot of the longer term metrics, whether it's five, 10 year PE ratios work much better than the one year ones. Doesn't mean they're perfect, but one of the things you can do, and same thing for like a trend following indicator. So say a 200 day moving average works great over time. However, the example we often give is going into 1987, had you had a 200 day simple moving average or lower, you would have been out during the, the Black Monday. And that was a 20% drop. But if you had a 200 day 
moving average or longer length you would have been invested during the and both of them are, are trend following indicators long term so one takeaway is that okay once you have some indicators you like or factors you can also use a composite so for valuation factors you could use a composite of say five valuation metrics because maybe pe is saying one thing and price of sales is saying th something else enterprise value to ebitda so once you have this this composite it gives you a blended reading and i think that's a lot more useful than any just one and in general they almost always say the same thing when you're at extremes if a, if a market or stock is really cheap or really expensive, they should all agree. And one of the other, you also have a blended outcome. So if you use, for example, trend following indicators and said, all right, I'm, instead of just using the 200 day, I'm going to use the 50 day, the 100 day and the 300 day. And I'm going to use a third allocation on each to go in and out of these markets as a way of timing so that I avoid the all in, all out emotional trauma of being in a market and being on the wrong side of it. There, there's a couple different takeaways from that. First being, I wouldn't put any money based on just one indicator. You want a lot of confirming indicators, but you also have to test if they work in the first place. And then also the nice thing about having a composite reading or using multiple indicators is you get more of a blended outcome. Okay. So maybe the way to think about it is stop trying to look for the one indicator that's going to be correct by using the composite. In essence, you're playing defense, preventing you from having any one that's going to be decidedly wrong. And there's a lot of hindsight bias and hand wringing that you'll get from just choosing one indicator. Now, that's what most people want. Most people want that holy grail. They want to set someone to tell them, you got to sell stocks now. You got to buy gold now. And that's just not the way that it works. Okay. You know, there's no magical indicator that works all the time. And in fact, Usually what you'll have is one indicator that's wrong, 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 and people declare it doesn't work anymore, it's the worst, and then all of a sudden it's right again. And, and some, and this is what why it's so useful to look back to history, a lot of the ones people talk on TV don't work at all. And, and in some cases, they work in the complete opposite direction. I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone go on TV, talk about it, they'll be like, well, we like this stock because of X or Y or Z. And in reality, it's they're using it in the exact 180 degree wrong fashion if history was any guide. I mean, the most famous example of that is beta. So if you look at the beta of a stock to the market, you know, most of the original financial theory was that the more risk you were taking, the higher beta, the higher return. It was actually opposite, 180 degrees opposite of that. So you, you got to kind of first look to history as a guide, but also in my mind, use don't bet the farm on just one magical indicator because... That's going to that's going to cause you a lot of stress. So people looking for one indicator to tell them exactly when to get in and out is actually a good segue into the next questions, which are about market timing. And we actually got several of these, but I'm going to read just one since they all basically ask the same thing. As a result of inheritance, we came into at least a million in cash. I'm wondering if there's any research on the best way to put the cash into a pricey market. Put all of it in at once, average it in over three years assume inevitable corrections and buy in on them. And he's referencing, or excuse me, other people were questioning specifically the U.S. market, but let's just talk about expensive markets in general. So first of all, I would, if that person was a client or potential client, I'd have them come in and say, okay, first of all, let's take a step back. First of all, I think you should have a diversified global portfolio. So yes, if there is one expensive market, usually some asset class elsewhere is going to diversify. They all zig and zag. So right now, the way we see the world, we think U.S. stocks are expensive. But U.S. stocks are only going to make up a fraction of this globally diversified portfolio that's going to own foreign stocks, which we think are really cheap, by the way. It's going to own foreign bonds. It's going to own U.S. bonds. It's going to own real estate. It's going to own commodities. It's going to own managed futures. It's going to own all these stuff. Don't focus on just one market, though most people in their head always want to focus on U.S. stocks for some unknown reason. So that's one. So, so never you, that you already, that takes the valuation question out of consideration. You're, it's kind of like you're asking the wrong question. However, there's two other questions embedded in this. One is, all right, we got this lump sum of money. How should we invest it? And let's say they were going to invest in the Trinity portfolio or, or a global asset allocation portfolio. That portfolio has positive expected returns over time. So mathematically, the best thing to do would be invest today because you're going to have positive expected returns over the next 1, 5, 10, 20 years. However, and I tell almost everyone we talk to, I say, look, you want to avoid, and we mentioned this a minute ago, 
the hindsight emotional trauma of putting in this inheritance and one of the markets or some of them tanking in the next three months and you you having a 20 percent drawdown which will happen in any asset allocation portfolio you're going to lose 20 25 percent at some point okay so if you went all in and that happened in the next three months what's going to happen that client's going to sell everything they're going to go find another advisor well they'll sit on it for a year then they'll go find another advisor rinse repeat okay so another thing you could do is say okay look here's my policy portfolio i want to avoid the headache of whatever trauma of stress of my sister harassing me that I've invested this and it's gone terrible. So I'm going to implement it in at dollar cost average in over the next year or two years or five years or decade, depending on your time frame. And to me, that's a completely reasonable thing to do. Mathematically, it is not the best thing to do. You could also have some things in place where you say, look, we're going to implement this. We're going to keep 50% in cash and we're going to put some in. I mean, wh whatever the rules may be, set them and then just kind of be done with it. What, what you want to avoid is the looking over your shoulder and say, man, I wish I should have, could have, would have done this or wow, we, we sh shouldn't have done this. And so dollar cost averaging helps to spread that out. The last part of that question, which I don't really want to answer, but people ask so much is that, all right, if I have to invest in one market, and I don't know why you ever would, but if I have to invest in US stocks and I know that they're on the expensive side, what should I do? And we're gonna ignore all the other things I just said, which is the good advice portion. But if you had to invest in US stocks, I would say the same things I always do. I say, look, lower your expectations. So we think US stocks will do 4% maybe over the next decade. Two, try to come up with an investing approach that adds a benefit over market cap investing. So whether that's our favorite shareholder yield or any other combinations of value, momentum, quality, et cetera, that we think will be better. Or you could even try to do some long short approaches or add some trend following approaches. All those things are better probably than just a straight up buy and hold of the market cap index. But what you want to avoid doing is, is that timing. You know, I'm going to sit in cash, but I'm going to wait for the dip. That's, you know, what, how big of a dip? 10%? 20? 50? 80? Well, what if you looked at your potential global asset allocation in distinct buckets? And so this guy with the million bucks, and he looks around and says, all right, emerging market looks great over the next decade, so I'm going to go and put my full allocation into emerging market. But here in the U.S., uh, we're looking overvalued, so I'm going to sit in cash, willing to sit in cash for up to three years, waiting for the pullback. You sort of give yourself a little bit more guardrails. We've had a perfect example of that. Rewind three years. person that does this would have then sat out a three-year run in U.S. stocks, so they weren't cheap then. They've gone up for three years. Was that based upon Schiller? Yeah, but on any valuation metric. Okay. There's no way you could have said they're cheap. You know, you don't, they're not a bubble and they're not crazy expensive, but they're on the expensive side and rest of the world is cheaper. There's no question in my mind. So had you said that three years ago, what's happened? You would have been invested in emerging markets that have gone down three years in a row. Same thing with commodities. You would have sat out U.S. stocks going up. First of all, that guy would have done that for a year and then quit, you know, <laughs> or two years, forget about three. Absolutely. And then what's happened this year, of course, emerging markets are ripping. Commodities are doing well. Um, some commodities are doing well. U.S. stocks are doing okay, but not as not as great performance as foreign stocks. The whole key in my mind is having a policy portfolio to stick with, and, and a blended asset allocation is a great first step. Then the Trinity portfolio, the same thing. We said you can add tilts like value and momentum. You can add a trend following exposure, which is a big one. You know, so look if you're uncomfortable and you have some in buy and hold, add some to trend, which should be doing something totally different a lot of the time, and that's a good portfolio. But then we stick with it. Uh, this kind of desire to to predict the future and be able to guess when markets are going to be going up and going down. That's just not the way it works. Remind me again what the uh, net expected return is for the global asset allocation. Historically, if you, you look at all of the asset allocations in our book, global asset allocation, you can get a free copy at freebook.mebfavor.com. The real returns, net of inflation, is in that four to six ban for all of those. Now, they don't include tilts. They don't include trend following. That's just buy and hold global asset allocation. And if you remember, 
Stocks historical return is five around the world. Bonds is one and a half, and bills is a half. So we it's actually four and a half, one and a half, half. We round it up and call it the five two one rule. It's easier to remember. We're optimists. U.S. stocks were six and a half, but they were an outlier. So an asset allocation historically has been in that four to six range, and we think that's a pretty good guide for a portfolio going forward. Thing is, there's not that much inflation around the world right now. So expected returns, take that four to six percent, add a percent, maybe two of inflation, and you end up with a lot more muted returns than the historical returns that I think a lot of people are looking for. But adding some of those tilts and adding trend following, I think can actually help uh, as well. Seems like a lot of this could be addressed simply by people adjusting their expectations some. In terms of longer term returns. Yeah, but it's tough because it there's a lot of other things that come into play. So example, your advisor's fees and mutual fund fees. So advisor average 1%, mutual fund average 1.25. That's no big deal when markets return 10%, 15% a year. You're gonna only you're skimming off a tiny bit. If a market returns, if you're expecting them to return 3% a year, that's you know, each of those fees is a third of the fee, uh, a third of the return. So there's a lot of unintended. So even if you do have lower expectations, there's a lot of behavioral changes that start to happen. And people think in nominal terms, not real returns. And that's unfortunate because they should think in real returns, but it's a lot harder. How many investment books are written with real returns? I can count them probably in a few hands. But uh, you know, comparing a return of 10% in the 70s when inflation was 8% to a return in the 20 teens, when inflation is essentially almost zero is, is totally different. All right. So it sounds like basically you're telling this guy to put his money in and just uh, let long-term returns do their thing. Well, come up, come up with a policy portfolio that you're comfortable with. I don't care if that's CDs. I don't care if you put your money in whatever it may be, but it's whatever you can sleep at night and what works for you. For me, I mentioned many times, it's similar to the Trinity portfolio, half in a global uh, market cap portfolio that invested all global assets tilts towards value and momentum and the other half in trend falling strategies. And that for me is sort of my perfect allocation. But uh, for a lot of people, it, it's 60, 40 and forget about it. So let's move on. Now we have a, uh, a hodgepodge of random questions. First one is, uh, should your primary residence count towards your asset allocation and portfolio? In my case, I have looked at the correlation between my house price in San Francisco and the S&P 500 and found the correlation to be over 90%. One of the beliefs that most investors adhere to that is wrong is that real estate is a good investment in, in your house, in housing. I don't mean this specifically, so someone just pulled their hair out and probably crashed their car listening to this. <laughs> so obviously real estate's local. Obviously, if you pick a really cheap house and fix it up and you know have a lot of domain knowledge. I'm not talking to you. But in general, on average, and that's the same thing, by the way, as picking a really good stock instead of buying the stock market. So if you're a great stock picker, I'm not talking to you when I'm talking about indexing the S&P. Historically, real estate and housing has not been a good investment. On average, the real returns are about 1% a year. So that's on par with bonds and bills. But again, you're just Way talking less here, than stocks. just to clarify, you're talking about capital appreciation versus like rental real estate with that's cash flowing, right? Correct. So REITs, for example, maybe are, are a blend of equities and bonds. It looks more like a 60-40. And Schiller has this going back, I think, to 1890. You know, total house price appreciation is about 1% a year. So yes, so... Should you consider, and a lot of people, their home is their one of the majority biggest portions of their portfolio. And so, yes, absolutely, you shouldn't consider it. And the way that I would think about it, I would think about it as a blend of roughly 60, 40 US stocks, or if you include some REITs, you know, if, if you're a REIT investor, I would consider reducing a little bit of the REIT exposure, but it's the same difference. REITs look like 60-40, which our buddy Modena talked about. But, but I, I would like to add a comment because I saw this on our buddy Morgan Twitter stream where he posted a link to a study on bank rate and a survey and asked people, which would be the best way to invest your money that you wouldn't need for the next 10 years? And I'm going to tell you, 25% said real estate. 23% said cash, which is savings and CDs. 16% said gold. 16% said the stock market. 
5% said bonds, and another 14% said none or refused to answer. That, with the exception of bonds, that is an almost perfect order, inverse order of historical returns. So stocks historically return the most, and you can kind of put gold, real estate, and T-bills in sort of all that same bucket. You know, they're not historically... They've not been great investment. They're not bad. I mean, it's not a bad investment. I mean, real estate, 1% a year is positive. And if you can certainly add value to that equation by having some uh, domain knowledge, plus it's a huge pain in the ass. You know, there's maintenance. You got to fix it up. You got to pay, you know, include all the taxes you have to pay and property. It's just, oh my God. Well, what do you think about this though? So if you're talking Spoken about like your, a true renter, by the way, <laughs> if you're thinking about your primary residence, Obviously, I think that affects your, your net worth. But if you're talking about your portfolio, when I think of investments, I think of a certain amount of inherent liquidity. You can't sell your home if you come into a crisis like you can sell a stock portfolio and suddenly have cash available to pay down you know, a, a, the need for a new car or a child breaks a leg or something like yeah, that. And, and also, don't forget that there's a 6% transaction fee when you do want to sell it, which is absurd, by the way, still, that that hasn't been arbitraged away by, by the internet. And it's also absurd to me. I've never understood why housing price insurance hasn't taken hold. That's one of the strangest yeah. things to me, that that's not a business that every time you buy a house, you say, all right, would you like to pay some insurance on the value of the house? That's such an easy business. Schiller, I think, started one back in the day, and it, it I just it's never taken hold. I don't know why. This all having been said, real estate, not a great investment. Jason Zweig has a wonderful article we'll link to. I don't remember the name of it, but it's basically like, look, the vast majority of the benefit of a house is not the financial returns. It's the emotional attachment to that house or really that home. So whether it's, you know, your family growing up or having, you know, a home base that you get very emotionally attached to and memories. And that's, that's what's important there. It's not the investment side of it. So yes, should you be smart about it? Of course. Don't do something really stupid. And I think, well, what's the average... There's a rule of thumb of what sort of property you can buy. And I think it's on average, it's been around four times income, four or five times income. We'll, we'll add a chart from Ned Davis. We can find it uh, that, that lists it historically. And this also shows you when you have the distortions of 2006, 2007, where all of these indicators went totally just bananas saying um, the appreciation of the past 10, 20 years is totally abnormal. All these people reaching to buy stuff they can't afford. And the flip side happened after the crash. But it seems to be back, at least here in L.A., back into a crazy town again with the, uh, with the prices. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, I'm sure this is an elementary question. What do you mean by rebalancing taxable accounts by cash flows? So let's say you have a global portfolio, Trinity portfolio, whatever it may be. Typically, people rebalance it once a year just to keep it in line. So let's say you had a 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. You know, stocks go up a ton, bonds go down. You rebalance in the next year to keep it in line with the percentages you're targeting. And that's fine in a tax-exempt account. And we even say you could rebalance it every two, three, four years. It doesn't really matter as long as you rebalance it at some point. But once a year is fine because it's a, it's a nice time frame to kind of review your investments. Two is that if you're in a taxable account, you got to be careful because every time you make a transaction, it creates potential taxable events. So yes, you should still rebalance it back to targets yearly, but try to be tax efficient about it. So, you know, if you have, so let's say you just got a big bonus and you want to invest it. Well, you should put it in the asset classes that are farthest from the their tolerance band. So if your 60% in stocks has gone down to 50, you would add it to stocks. And the opposite is true. If you're going to go buy a car or a house, you want to take it out of your investment account. You want to take it out of the areas that will help you get back to that target. So if stocks have gone up to 80%, you'll want to sell the stock portion. Now, of course, you want to do that tax efficiently. So, for example, if you're going to be adding it to the one that's dropped a bunch, maybe you'll sell your S&P ETF and then buy a related total market or can, you know Cambria ETF, hopefully, um, to replace it. And so you'll take the loss and then invest it and get it back up to, to target. How do you blend that idea with sort of momentum in that 
if if an asset class is rising, you don't want to get out of it. You want to let it keep rising. You want to let it do its thing, make you money. Seems like you're sort of cutting off your nose to spite your face if you're selling an appreciating asset to rebalance into an, an asset class that's not doing very well. Never never heard that phrase before. I don't even know if it makes any sense. What? Um, cut off your nose to spite your face? Yeah. Is that something people say? Well, you're just out of touch, Meb. <laughs> Yeah, but but so like you know all of our trend following studies, we also include rebalancing as well or not. And again, it shows that rebalancing makes sense as long as you do it sometime because other, otherwise things get way out of whack. So a traditional sixty forty, if you just let it drift, eventually it's going to end up almost totally in stocks because stocks have returned more in the U.S. Now, by the way, this is a great example. I was reading a Ned Davis piece this morning. Japanese stocks over since nineteen eighty five. So that's going on 20 plus years? No, 30. 30 years. Japanese stocks since 1985 have returned 2.5% total. So that includes dividends. Hmm. Japanese bonds, 4.2%. But this is total, not per Total annual. return. Total. Per year. Per, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just making sure. Total return per year. When, I, when you say total return, I mean including dividends. Uh, I'm sorry. Annualized total return, 2.5% stocks, 4.2% bonds. That's incredible. You know, most people think stocks for the long run, right? That stocks, that's 30 years that stocks have not outperformed bonds. In Canada, our, our Maple Leaf buddies was just up in Calgary. Canadian stocks and bonds, same return over the past 30 years. I mean, it goes back to the other question. If you're trying to wait and time markets perfectly, forget it. Just put your money in in a balanced global portfolio. Agreed. I agreed. I like that. Okay, so back to the rebalancing. Look, rebalancing, you just do it at some point. doesn't really matter when. Be smart about it, tax efficient about it. There's a lot of automated services that can do it for you nowadays. You don't have to worry about it, but be uh, certainly mindful of the tax versus tax exempt. Okay. Uh, two more questions and we'll wrap it up. Um, second to last. Regarding shareholder yield, our firm is dividend oriented. Many clients like dividends and the regular cash flow. But if we begin by filtering down to only those companies that are in the top 20 to 25 percent of shareholder yielders, then looked only at those that pay a dividend, would that make sense? I understand that this is not a pure play way to apply your strategy, but will we miss a lot by attempting to implement it in this manner? First, I think it's fine. Second, shareholder yield, by the way, is, is combining dividends paid out as well as net stock buybacks. So buybacks minus issuance. And we're a little different. We also include debt pay down as one of the few shops that do that. But, but shareholder yield in general, dividends and buybacks. So once you get to the top quartile, which is what he's talk, talking about, or quintile, which is top 20%, or decile, which is top 10%, then yes, can you add some value? So once you're there, that's already fine. And then just selecting dividends, I think is okay. But more importantly, what I would do is tilt towards value. So if you look in that shareholder yield quartile box, and then chop that up into a further quartile, or whatever it may be, quintile, and there's some good studies we'll post to the uh, show notes, it shows that if you pick the best shareholder yield and the best value, does much better than the best shareholder yield and worst valuations. So I would certainly use value as a filter. We talked about value composites and using multiple value indicators, but also momentum and quality. All three of those are great factor groups to use once you've already determined the top shareholder yield quartile. I mean, dividends, look, I think that's fine. I certainly think that's better than dividends alone. So you're, you're making one step in the right direction. But I would also think about considering value and potentially quality and momentum as well. Okay. Sounds like he might also want to remind his clients about the uh, tax ramifications of uh, the dividends versus buybacks. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about this on a post. I forget what it's called, but it's something like the least popular post we're ever going to write. But it was about you know dividends you're always having to pay taxes every time you get a check. Whereas for other methods of avoiding dividend stocks and potentially focusing on capital gains um, for a taxable investor can be a lot more tax efficient than, uh, than dividends alone. Okay. Last question. It's from an Italian investor who uh, seems a little scared about currency risk. He writes, uh, as a European investor, it's hard for me to stick with a strategy that invests most of the time in U.S. dollar-based assets. 
But at the same time, if I had indulged in home country bias over the last five to 10 years, the yield would have been disappointing. Can you suggest some theoretical or practical considerations that can aid a foreign investor? I love Italy. Italian stocks have been a big laggard this year. They're, they're definitely cheap. Greece, Greece and Italian stocks just can't seem to get their act together. Look, I mean, we've said this many times. It doesn't matter where you live. You want to be global. And it's particularly important in smaller countries. So, yes, even in the U.S., we say half your assets should be outside the U.S. in foreign markets. In the smaller you go for countries, you, you know, you want to have a bigger global, global exposure. And so not just having exposure to your home country stocks and bonds and currency, but also global becomes even more important in a country like Italy, who I'm guessing is what, 5% of world GDP, you know, is, is, it's almost entirely global. And, you know, it, it's, it's hard to do personality wise, but you, you really want to think in terms of a global allocation because you're going to end up with a much better possible outcome, I think, than just picking one country or being majority dominated in your own currency and country. I'm not sure if this is what he was asking. I might be reading into it more, but I kind of took from this a question about if I live in a country that has a great deal more currency fluctuation than the U.S. dollar against the U.S. dollar, what base currency should I use for my investments? I mean, that seems to add another complication to things. Well, his base is always going to be euro because he's in, he's in Italy. I was going to say the lira. It's been a while. Um, it's going to be euro because he's in Italy, right? And that's his home country currency. But you want exposure to foreign currencies Ask anyone in Brazil or Russia or elsewhere who's seen the currencies in recent years just get crushed, right? If you're in Venezuela and you have all of your assets in Venezuela, well, tough darts. You know, I mean, you just had your currencies just been getting destroyed. And so uh, you want to have a global currency and global exposure. So a lot of your assets and foreign stock exposure is a great way to do it. Foreign bonds have a certain percentage. In his case, what's the right answer? I don't know. Half, two thirds, three quarters, four fifths. I think that's totally reasonable. Um, his is the euro, so it, it wouldn't be that high. But, but I mean, I think in general, at least half. I mean, in the, I, we recommend to our U.S. investors it's half. And currencies, I mean, you got to remember currencies over long ter- time periods in general, they kind of buoy and they, they seesaw back and forth and have fairly stable real returns. So they adjust for inflation over time. But over time can be very, very long time period. So, you know, you want to have a global exposure. And, you know, in his case, look, you want to have a lot in foreign currencies. Fair enough. That's it for me. Anything else you want to add? No, I'm tired of talking. It's been about an hour today. But look, you guys keep sending in the questions. We love doing this. Feedback at the MebFaberShow.com. You can always find the show notes at MebFaber.com forward slash podcast. We, uh, we love the reviews. Keep them coming. We'd like to see any. Go to iTunes and view any other of the, what, 14 shows we've done. we got a lot of great guests coming up. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing.